Bom dia, bem-vindos ao segundo dia do nosso quarto workshop de inovação em engenharia biomédica. Agora vou passar para o inglês para apresentar o nosso primeiro palestrante de hoje. So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the fourth workshop of innovation in biomedical engineering. And this morning, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce uh, the distinguished speaker of this second morning. Uh, Dr. Ramakrishna Mukamala from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I've been knowing Dr. Mukamala for a while, and uh, I've been, uh, uh, I was a visiting scholar in his laboratory at Michigan State University when he was a faculty there. So uh, I consider Ram my mentor and a friend, and of course, an outstanding researcher. Dr. Mukamala holds a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And after completing his postdoctoral training at MIT, uh, became a faculty in the electrical and computer engineering department at Michigan State University. Uh, he received multiple awards uh, during the early phases of his career, such as an, an NSF career award and an American Heart Association Scientist Development Grant. Uh, he also helped uh, a startup company, Ratio Medical, to translate uh his research to hospital use uh last year he moved from michigan state university to university of pittsburgh where he's currently a professor in the department of bioengineering and in the department of anesthesiology and perioperative medicine uh again in the medical school of the university of pittsburgh uh dr mukamala also received several awards for his uh, publishing activity for example He was the recipient of an IEEE Engineering in Medicine and Biology Society most impactful paper in 2019, as well as several teaching awards during his time at Michigan State. Uh, he is currently also an associate editor for IEEE Transactions on Biomedical Engineering and is the chair of IEEE MBS Technical Committee on Cardiopulmonary Systems and Physiology-Based Engineering. So his research over the years Uh, has dealt with several problems uh, in the cardiovascular field, uh, from uh, analysis of cardiovascular recordings to assess autonomic control, to uh, monitoring for critical care applications. Uh, and in the last years, probably decade, I would say, he has mainly focused on uh, the topic of his talk today, which is titled Advanced Blood Pressure Measurement. So. This is my introduction. I will just give the word for a second to Luis Eduardo for some uh, notes, uh, I assume in Portuguese, and then we will go back to Rama and let him start his talk. Federico. Uh... Bom, pessoal, vou fazer rapidamente a, a introdução do palestrante em português, né? para aqueles que não puderam acompanhar exatamente o que foi falado em inglês, o professor Ramakrishna Mukamala, ele é formado em engenharia biomédica pela Duke University, ele fez o um mestrado, doutorado, pós-doutorado no MIT, ele tem como interesses de pesquisa a engenharia cardiovascular e fisiologia computacional, dispositivos médicos, M-Health, monitoramento de pacientes, sensores fisiológicos, além de processamento e modelagem de sinais fisiológicos. Atualmente, o professor Mukamala trabalha no departamento de bioengenharia é, e também no departamento de anestesiologia e medicina perioperatória da Universidade de Pittsburgh. Ele recebeu um prêmio da NSF, National Science Foundation, e também um financiamento da America Heart Association, por suas primeiras pesquisas sobre análise de forma de onda de pressão arterial, além de auxiliar a empresa Richa Medical a, a traduzir, né, a, a levar essa pesquisa para o um uso hospitalar. E ele também recebeu o prêmio I3E MBS, né, de engenharia biomédica, de artigo de maior impacto e o prêmio de inovação no ano de 2019, né, pela Universidade de Michigan State University, por sua, por sua pesquisa recente sobre medição de pressão arterial sem braçadeira. 
Eu gostaria de acrescentar dois avisos para o pessoal que está assistindo né, essa, essa sessão. Primeiro que é, vocês podem fazer, colocar perguntas no chat, né? podem colocar perguntas em inglês ou em português, a gente traduz, a gente passa essas questões, depois o professor Rama, se for o caso de, de ser feita em português, a gente vai dar um jeito aqui de traduzir, é, mas como vocês preferirem, portanto, em inglês ou em português, e é, haverá necessidade de vocês acessarem um link para registrar a presença no, no evento. Então, observar essas, esses dois pontos aí. Passo para você. Obrigado. Obrigado, Luiz Eduardo. Thank you, Rama. The mic is yours. Do you see my screen? Yes, you're good. Okay, okay. Uh, good morning, and uh, many thanks to Professor Aletti for an, the invitation and inter, an introduction. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak at this exciting workshop on innovation in biomedical engineering. Uh, as Dr. Aletti said, I've been a cardiovascular bioengineering researcher and translational scientist throughout my career. And uh, the principal aim of my research has been to establish new cardiovascular monitoring principles by integrating physiology, data analytics, and sensors. And in recent years, I've become interested in advancing blood pressure measurement. And today I'll present some of my work in this particular area. So did you see the next slide? Yes, we do. Okay, good. Uh, the research that I'll describe uh, today is a joint effort of several people, including my former students, Anand Chandrasekhar, Kirtan Natrajan, Jiankun Lu, Mingwu Gao, and Mohamed Yabaramanesh, as well as my co-investigators, mainly Jin Ohan of University of Maryland, but also Hao Min Cheng of Taipei, Omar Inan of Georgia Tech, and Barry Olivier of Michigan State. I would also like to acknowledge the NIH, US NIH, for being the main sponsors of our blood pressure measurement research. So here are the non-invasive blood pressure measurement methods that are currently available. Auscultation is the standard clinical method. A trained operator slowly deflates a cuff over the artery to listen to the carotid cuff sounds and thereby measure systolic and diastolic blood pressure using a manometer. Oscillometry is the most widely used method in clinical practice. Probably many of you or all of you have had a measurement with this device. Uh, the method employs the same inflatable cuff but with a single sensor inside this box to measure the pressure inside the cuff. The key advantage of this method is that it's automatic. Uh, but as I'll explain, oscillometry provides an indirect measurement of blood pressure. So volume clamp and tonometry, these are also cuff-based methods that provide the entire blood pressure waveform instead of just the maximum and minimum blood pressure. However, they carry major disadvantages relative to auscultation and oscillometry. And as a result, these two methods are mainly used in research. So on the whole, these methods have proven incredibly useful. With these methods, we have learned many things. Uh, we have learned that high blood pressure afflicts many people worldwide. He, here are data from almost a million subjects showing that the prevalence of hypertension increases from about 10% in young adults to over 70% in older adults. These epidemiological data are in contrast to other cardiovascular conditions such as AFib, atrial fibrillation, which predominantly affect the elderly. So this is a different problem. 
We have also learned that hypertension is a major cardiovascular risk factor. Here are famous data from a million subjects showing that the risk of mortality due to stroke or heart disease increases linearly with blood pressure for different age groups. In addition, we have learned that hypertension can be treated through lifestyle changes in medication. Here are data from 50,000 subjects showing that the risk of stroke and cardiovascular disease is significantly reduced with diuretics, beta blockers, and other medications. So despite the knowledge garnered with the current methods, cardiovascular disease and strokes remain far too common. Here are results from a recent large-scale systematic analysis showing that hypertension, high blood pressure, is the leading cause of disability-adjusted life years loss worldwide today. So one reason for the high mortality may be that many people do not have the means or interest to use the current blood pressure measurement methods because they require an inflatable cuff and are therefore not convenient enough or widely available. So to support that hypothesis, here are data from a few hundred thousand subjects. These data show that only 55% of hypertensives in developed nations and 45% of hypertensives in developing nations are aware of their, commit, of their condition and that an abysmal 15% of hypertensives overall have their blood pressure under control. So cuffless blood pressure monitoring technology could improve hypertension awareness rates by providing serial out of clinic measurements in the mass population. Note that out-of-clinic blood pressure measurements are ideal due to white coat and mast effects in the clinic in which patients present with higher or lower blood pressure than usual, while serial blood pressure measurements are needed to average out large blood pressure variability within a person that occur over time due to stress, physical activity, and other factors. Cuffless blood pressure monitoring technology could also improve hypertension control rates by providing continual feedback to the individual patient. That is, if you keep hitting a patient over the head with high blood pressure readings, they may finally become compliant in taking their medications. A secondary reason for the high mortality may be that the current blood pressure measurement methods are also not accurate enough. A few years ago, in the number one cardiovascular journal, a major, a major meta-analysis appeared. The analysis found that the current methods, especially oscillometry, are inaccurate in measuring blood pressure either at the brachial artery in the arm or near the heart which as I'll discuss is actually the ideal blood pressure to measure. The inaccuracy is clinically significant in the sense that more than 45% of patients with prehypertension or stage one hypertension and about 25% of patients with normotension or stage two hypertension end up being misclassified. So improved blood pressure measurement accuracy was the conclusion, the recommendation of the meta-analysis. So accurate blood pressure monitoring technology could improve cardiovascular risk stratification. Our overall goal is therefore to advance blood pressure monitoring on the accuracy convenience plane. Uh, I will present four new methods that we have developed with validation results. First, I will present a method for improving the accuracy of automatic cuff devices. Then, I will describe a method for extending a standard automatic arm cuff device for blood pressure measurement near the heart. That is what we call central, central blood pressure. 
Next, I will present a method for cuffless and high throughput tracking of blood pressure changes via weighing scale. And finally, I will describe a method for cuffless monitoring of absolute blood pressure via a smartphone. So let me start with cuff blood pressure measurement. Uh, most automatic cuff devices are based on the principle of oscillometry. Oscillometric devices act as both an actuator to alter the external pressure of the brachial artery via cuff inflation and deflation, and a sensor to measure the pressure inside the cuff. The measured cuff pressure indicates the applied pressure and is superimposed with tiny oscillations representing the pulsatile blood volume in the artery. Since the arterial blood volume pressure relationship is nonlinear, you can see that the amplitude of the oscillations varies with the applied cuff pressure. Blood pressure is computed from the oscillation amplitude versus cuff pressure function, which I'll henceforth call the oscillogram. So the blood pressure computation algorithm is based on population averages. For example, the conventional algorithm is to first compute mean blood pressure as the cuff pressure at which the oscillogram is maximal, and then compute each of systolic and diastolic pressure as the cuff pressures at which the oscillogram is some fixed ratio of its maximal value. So in some, the auto automatic arm cuff devices, they do not directly measure the blood pressure. They compute the blood pressure from related measurements using an algorithm. And that algorithm is based on population averages instead of based on the individual patient. And as a result, the devices may only be accurate in subjects with typical blood pressure levels. In fact, uh, consistent with the recent meta-analysis findings, it is well known that oscillometric device accuracy degrades in patients with high pulse pressure due to large artery stiffening. Pulse pressure is just systolic pressure minus diastolic pressure. And large artery stiffening occurs in everyone with aging. Uh, so pulse pressure will widen uh, over as you get older, and these devices, uh, their accuracy degrade in those patients. So our idea was to employ mathematical modeling to improve oscillometric blood pressure computation accuracy. Uh, we derived a model of the oscillogram by assuming incompressible tissue surrounding the artery and a linear pressure volume relationship for the cuff. Uh, the resulting model represents the oscillogram as the difference between the arterial blood volume relationship evaluated at systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. The derivative of this volume pressure relationship with respect to pressure gives the arterial compliance curve. Here's what a brachial artery compliance curve looks like. This example shows how the arterial compliance, that's the y-axis, which is an inverse metric of how stiff the arteries are, changes with the transmural pressure of the artery. Transmural pressure is the difference in the internal blood pressure minus the external cuff pressure you can see that the compliance peaks near zero transmural pressure and that the artery, which is like rubber, remains open even over a range of negative transmural pressures. So an important side point is that this model indicates that the maximum oscillation does not correspond to the mean blood pressure, 
which has been the common belief even before the advent of oscillometric cuff devices in the 1970s. We showed that the model instead predicts that the maximum oscillation denotes a weighted average of systolic and diastolic blood pressure where the weightings are given by the widths of the arterial compliance curve over the negative and positive transmural pressure regimes. We then validated this prediction using patient data by showing that the weighted average determined with invasive blood pressure corresponds to the maximum oscillation significantly better than invasive mean blood pressure corresponds to the maximum oscillation. You can see that the data predictions are much more on the identity line for this formula than the mean blood pressure, the traditionally held belief. So we employed this model to develop a patient-specific algorithm for computing blood pressure from a standard oscillogram. Uh, the unknown parameters in the model, again, include systolic and diastolic blood pressure and define the arterial compliance curve. Our further idea was to estimate these patient-specific parameters by optimally fitting the model to the measured oscillogram. A parametric function is used to define the compliance curve, and constrained least squares is applied for parameter estimation. So this algorithm is specific to the patient at the time of measurement in the sense that arterial stiffness is simultaneously measured with the blood pressure levels. The current automatic cuff devices may be thought of as assuming everyone has the same arterial stiffness. And for that reason, that can limit its accuracy. Here, we're trying to measure both stiffness and blood pressure from the same oscillometric cuff device. So to investigate the patient-specific algorithm, we studied one 145 mainly cardiac catheterization patients. So we simultaneously measured the cuff pressure waveform for analysis via a high-end office device on one arm and reference blood pressure via mainly gold standard brachial artery catheterization. So a catheter we put on the other arm for invasive measurement of the arm blood pressure as the reference uh, for our algorithm. And we utilized 57 of the subject records to optimize the patient-specific algorithm, to figure out how to get it to work best. And uh, the remaining 88 subject records were used to compare its accuracy to the office device. We had a cuff device on one arm, and that was a high-end office device that estimated blood pressure on its own. And uh, we also had the cuff pressure waveform from this cuff that we could apply our patient-specific algorithm to. And then we could compare both methods to the invasive blood pressure on the other arm. So here are the blinded precision accuracy results. In patients with normal pulse pressure, the patient-specific algorithm in red showed comparable precision errors to the high-end office device in blue. These are all similar. But in patients with high pulse pressure due to large artery stiffening, the patient-specific algorithm produced lower precision errors. In particular, the algorithm significantly reduced the magnitude of the precision error by one-third, the percentage of precision errors exceeding 10 millimeter of mercury by one half, and the percentage of precision errors exceeding 15 millimeters of mercury by two thirds relative to the office device. So in sum, a patient specific algorithm can improve the accuracy of automatic cuff blood pressure measurements in the many patients with high pulse pressure without compromising the accuracy 
in patients with normal pulse pressure. Uh, now let me move on to central, central blood pressure measurement, blood pressure measurement near the heart. So when, when the heart ejects blood, at each time the heart ejects blood, a pressure wave is initiated that travels through the arteries. When this wave reaches the microcirculation, a significant part of the wave is reflected back towards the heart. As a result, the actual blood pressure waveform at a given arterial site arises as the sum of the forward and backward traveling waves at that site. Since wave reflection occurs mainly at the microcirculation, there is little time delay between the forward and backward wave in the periphery. So adding the backward wave to the forward wave increases the brachial pulse pressure. On the other hand, the forward and backward waves in the central aorta are shifted by the time it takes the forward wave to reach the microcirculation and return back to the heart. So you could see the forward and backward wave, they're time delayed. So summing the backward wave to the forward wave has much less impact on the central pulse pressure. Because of this time shift, when you add the two, the pulse pressure won't go up as much as it does in the brachial artery. So for this reason, and perhaps counterintuitively to you, pulse pressure, right, mm -hmm. systolic minus diastolic pressure, becomes progressively amplified with increasing distance from the heart. So as you move away from the heart, the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the blood pressure signal increases, not decreases. And the extent of this pulse pressure amplification varies with the wave travel time, how fast the wave moves. We call that pulse transit time. And to a lesser extent, with the re wave reflection coefficient. So it is central blood pressure, blood pressure near the heart, that truly determines cardiac performance, not arm blood pressure, brachial blood pressure. Uh, because of its greater physiologic relevance, central blood pressure could provide superior clinical value. And in fact, studies have shown that central pulse pressure is a better cardiovascular risk stratifier than brachial pulse pressure. However, direct measurement of central blood pressure either requires an invasive catheter or an expert operator to implement tonometry on the carotid artery. This is a very difficult procedure uh, because when you do tonometry, you need some supporting bone to push the sensor down and there is no su supporting bone in the carotid artery. So the upshot is that central blood pressure is more relevant, but brachial cuff blood pressure is way easier to measure. So our idea was to invoke physiologic knowledge to develop an algorithm for extending a standard automatic arm cuff device for indirect measurement of central blood pressure. And we created this algorithm is what I call a pragmatic algorithm. First, the entire brachial blood pressure waveform is derived from the variable amplitude cuff pressure oscillation waveform measured by the device. In particular, this waveform is ensemble averaged over the lower cuff pressure range, wherein the arterial blood volume pressure relationship may be more linear. After scaling the individual beats to equalize their amplitude and discarding atypical beats. The average waveform over the beat, the average single beat waveform, is calibrated to the patient-specific systolic and diastolic pressure values to yield a brachial blood pressure-like waveform. So previously, the patient-specific algorithm 
was giving the systolic and diastolic pressures. And by performing this ensemble averaging, we can get a, a, a waveform, a waveform, not just a maximum and minimum, but a waveform. So this is the waveform in the brachial artery. So then the second step is to take a transfer function and apply it to this waveform to convert it to the central blood pressure waveform near the heart. The transfer function is defined by a tube load model of wave reflection with parameters indicating the pulse transit time and wave reflection coefficient. The wave reflection coefficient is set to a nominal value as the transfer function is typically insensitive to that parameter. But the pulse transit time is a crucial transfer function parameter and it is determined based on its inverse relationship with mean blood pressure. This is something I'll talk about at length soon. And this way, the transfer function can vary within a patient and from patient to patient. So wh what happens is you, we apply, we derive the brachial blood pressure waveform, we compute the mean value of this waveform, and that will determine the pulse transit time parameter of the transfer function, and then we apply the transfer function to this waveform to get the central blood pressure waveform. And from that waveform, we can detect the peak and the minimum to get the central systolic and diastolic pressure. So to investigate this physiologic algorithm, we studied 87 cardiac catheterization patients. We simultaneously measured the cup pressure waveforms for analysis via a high-end office device on an arm, and we measured reference central blood pressure with a gold standard ascending aorta catheter. We put a catheter in the ascending aorta near the heart, um, and this was done in cardiac catheterization patients. And we utilized 36 of the patient records to optimize the physiologic algorithm, to make it work as good as possible. And that included determining the nominal value for this wave reflection coefficient parameter. And then we used the remaining 51 patient records to assess the accuracy of the method. So here are the blinded accuracy results in terms of correlation and bland Altman plots. You can see that the algorithm yielded central blood pressure bi bias errors within three millimeter mercury in magnitude and precision errors from 6.8 to nine millimeter mercury. These errors nearly satisfy the regulatory bias and precision limits of five and eight millimeter mercury. So in sum, the physiologic algorithm can allow central blood pressure to be measured reliably and in the exact same way as traditional brachial cuff blood pressure. So while non-invasive devices for indirect central blood pressure monitoring are currently available, none offer this level of convenience. So now I'll move on to cuffless blood pressure measurement. Many people today are interested uh, in cuffless blood pressure measurement, uh, not only in academia, uh, but also in industry. And uh, I would say that uh, this interest started to grow maybe around 2015. And uh, you can read all about cuffless blood pressure in articles in the media, for example. Um, pulse transit time. Uh, something I talked about, or PTT, pulse transit time, or PTT, is again the time delay for the pressure wave to travel between proximal and distal arterial sites. The pressure wave can be visualized as acute dilation of the arterial wall, as shown here, and typically moves much faster than blood. PTT is often inversely related to blood pressure. 
This is one over PTT. That's why you see a positive relationship. And it can be detected simply from the relative timing between proximal and distal waveforms indicative of the arterial pulse. So PTT could potentially permit convenient cuffless blood pressure monitoring. All you have to do is measure two arterial pulses at different locations, and that doesn't require a cuff, detect the relative time delay, and the, the PT theory tells us that that time delay will be inversely related to the blood pressure. So the mechanism of the PTT blood pressure relationship is actually well understood. As blood pressure increases, the arteries become less compliant or stiffen because of the mechanical properties of the arterial wall. PTT in turn decreases due to fluid dynamic principles. So this is the inverse relationship between blood pressure and PTT. However, arterial stiffness could also change acutely via contraction of smooth muscle fibers on the arterial wall. But smooth muscle is relatively sparse in the aorta. In the aorta, which are called elastic arteries, there's less smooth muscle than in the smaller arteries, which are actually called muscular arteries because they have a lot of smooth muscle. As I also mentioned, arterial stiffening occurs with aging. However, this process occurs very slowly over time. So the upshot is that PTT through the aorta could permit cuffless blood pressure monitoring for durations of perhaps a year at a time in which aging and disease are not a major factor. So if we can measure PTT through the aorta, the main vessel of the body, that that will indicate blood pressure without using a cuff device for durations of maybe a year at a time. So our idea to measure PTT through the aorta was to employ ballistocardiography, or BCG for short. BCG measures the reactionary forces experienced by the body each time blood is ejected in the aorta. In other words, the body actually moves with each heartbeat. Here are various instruments that have been developed over the years to measure the BCG waveform. A key advantage of the BCG here is that it can be used to obtain a proximal arterial waveform from the aorta at a distal location. In this way, both proximal and distal waveforms can be obtained with a single recording device. So the PTT method requires two arterial waveform measurements. If you need two separate devices to record those waveforms, uh, a lot of complexities that rise, like synchronization of the waveforms in time, which is very important in a PTT calculation. BCG can allow measurement of a proximal waveform from a distal, uh, distal location, like in this form of a weighing scale. And that's, that allows both waveforms to be recorded with one device. So here, here's an example of a BCG waveform over one heartbeat. And here are more familiar examples of the ECG waveform and the blood pressure waveform over the same heartbeat. The BCG recording shows various waves, such as the I, J, K waves, which are typical of BCG recordings. But what is the mechanism of these waves? Why do these waves occur like they do? Uh, when I started this project uh, in 2014, I had no ideas for, un for answering this fundamental and longstanding question. So one of the first things we, we tried to do was to answer the question. And uh, 
we, in order to maximize the amount of information that can be garnered from the BCG waveform. So the better we understand these waves, the better off we are in uh, extracting the information needed for blood pressure tracking. We ended up conceiving a mathematical model to explain the BCG waves. We approximated the aorta as two tubes in cascade, as shown here. We then calculated the net force exerted by blood on the tubes to yield the simple model of the BCG waveform here. This model reveals the primary mechanism of the BCG waves. In particular, it indicates that the BCG waves are determined as the difference between blood pressure gradients in the descending and ascending aorta. A blood pressure gradient here is defined as the difference in blood pressure waveforms at the inlet and outlet of an aorta. So what this model says is that take the ascending aorta, take its inlet pressure, subtract it from its outlet pressure. Pressure, subtract it from its outlet pressure. Then subtract those two differences from each other and what you should get is the BCG waveform. So is this a good model? Uh, we tested the model and we tested it using aortic blood pressure waveforms measured from cardiac catheterization patients. Here's an example of the blood pressure waveforms measured from one patient. This is the inlet pressure of the ascending aorta, the outlet pressure of the ascending aorta, the inlet pressure of the descending aorta, and the outlet pressure of the descending aorta. So these are the measurements uh, that are needed to determine the validity of the model. And what we did is we applied the blood, these blood pressure waveforms to the simple model in order to predict the blood pressure waveforms. And here is the predicted BCG waveform from the patient. And here is uh, a measured BCG waveform for comparison. And here are the BCG waveforms predicted from all of the available patients. You can see that the simple model was able to predict all major waves in the BCG waveform. And this model gives us unique insights into the BCG waveform. For example, it indicates that the timing of the I wave corresponds to the timing of the blood pressure waveform specifically in the aortic arch. Further, further the model predicts that the time interval between the I wave onset and J wave peak corresponds to PTT through the aorta, whereas the JK amplitude is indicative of the peripheral pulse pressure. So in summary, the model tells us that the BCG waveform fiducial points indicate the aortic PTT and the peripheral pulse pressure. This means that we might not need two arterial waveforms, but rather only a single BCG waveform to track blood pressure. So in parallel with the modeling, we developed a BCG-based weighing scale for cuffless tracking of blood pressure changes. The system includes an adjustable strap integrated on the scale to measure a photoplethysmography or PPG waveform from the foot in addition to the BCG waveform. So two waveforms with, via a single recording device. PPG is a simple yet effective optical technique to measure changes in the pulsatile arterial blood volume. So our system computes PPT as either the time delay between the I wave onset 
of the BCG waveform and the trough of the PPG waveform, which I'll call BCG PPG time delay, or simply as the IJ interval in accordance with the model prediction. Note that both these time delays represent PTT through the aorta and may best track diastolic pressure, diastolic pressure, rather than systolic pressure because they're detected at the level of diastole. The JK amplitude is also detected by the system and it's, compute, it's detected to indicate the pulse pressure in accordance with the model. Systolic blood pressure, which equals diastolic pressure plus pulse pressure, is then tracked via one of these time delays and the JK amplitude. So to test the ability of this system to track blood pressure changes, we performed studies in human volunteers. We obtained aortic PTTs and the JK amplitude with the weighing scale system and referenced blood pressure via a finger cuff volume clamp device from 22 volunteers before and after mental arithmetic, a cold presser test, and post-exercise. These interventions all increased blood pressure, but they did so by different physiologic mechanisms. So here are the BP blood pressure change tracking results. The average intra-subject correlation coefficient. So we each subject has several measurements of the PTTs and JK amplitudes and blood pressure and we computed the correlation coefficient for each subject and then took the average over all the subjects. The average intra-subject correlation coefficient between the BCG PPG time delay and diastolic blood pressure was about 0.8. The corresponding correlation coefficient for the IJ interval tended to be lower but was not significantly different the average intra-subject correlation coefficient between the BCG PPG time delay JK amplitude combination with systolic blood pressure was also about 0.8. The corresponding correlation coefficient with the B for the BCG PPG time delay alone was about 30% lower. So the JK amplitude was crucial for systolic blood pressure tracking. Using the IJ interval in place of the BCG PPG time delay tended to yield lower co correlation coefficients with systolic blood pressure, but these differences were again not statistically significant. So putting things together, the results suggest that the BCG based system can independently track diastolic and systolic blood pressure changes reasonably well and uh, perhaps even without that adjustable foot strap, just with the scale alone for measuring BCG. So our weighing scale tracks changes in blood pressure. However, to obtain absolute blood pressure measurements, the measured PTT in units of milliseconds needs to be calibrated to blood pressure in units of millimeters of mercury. In fact, uh, a major challenge, probably the main challenge of the PTT patient. The conventional approach for constructing a patient-specific calibration curve is to obtain multiple cuff blood pressure and PTT pairs from the patient during interventions that vary the blood pressure and pulse transit time. So, to create a calibration curve, we need to measure cuff blood pressure and PTT in a subject at different levels of blood pressure. And then a calibration curve may be constructed by fitting a line or a curve to the measured PTT blood pressure data pairs. So when you form this calibration curve, 
We need cuff measurements and we need an intervention to change the blood pressure. And then after you do that, the curve could be used to achieve cuffless blood pressure monitoring via just the PTT measurement alone from the defined calibration curve for that patient. However, uh, having to do a blood pressure intervention makes this approach uh, less practical. So our idea was to construct a patient-specific calibration curve by exploiting the natural pulsatile variation in blood pressure. That is, blood pressure nominally varies from 80 to 120 millimeter of mercury with each heartbeat, right? So blood pressure is varying naturally with the heartbeat. Let's use those blood pressure changes to help us construct a patient-specific calibration curve. However, simply detecting the multiple time delays between proximal and distal waveforms at different blood pressure levels is not effective because the pressure wave is reflected at the microcirculation and returns to the heart, typically during systole. Because of wave reflection, the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude between the proximal and distal waveforms can even be negative. We therefore developed a nonlinear model method to compute PTT as a function of blood pressure from proximal and distal blood pressure waveforms. The nonlinear model accounts for the dependency of arterial compliance on blood pressure and wave reflection. So first, the parameters of, these, of this model are estimated so as to optimally couple the proximal blood pressure waveform to the distal blood pressure waveform in the least square sense. Then PTT as a function of blood pressure is defined by the model parameters. In this way, PTT for each and every blood pressure level in the cardiac cycle is effectively estimated after mathematically eliminating the reflected wave. And the resulting BP to PTT function can then be used as a patient-specific calibration curve. So by measuring a proximal blood pressure waveform and a distal blood pressure waveform, we can arrive at a curve that relates PTT to blood pressure without invoking an intervention to change blood pressure using this nonlinear model method. So does it work? Well, we studied data from animal experiments that we had previously performed. These data included proximal and distal blood pressure waveforms from 10, 12 subjects during a baseline period and various hemodynamic interventions, which vary the blood pressure widely. You can see in this example that the mean blood pressure changed by 100 millimeter of mercury uh, due to the interventions. And so what we did is we applied the nonlinear model method to construct a subject-specific calibration curve using the baseline data of each subject. We then tested the curve for each subject in terms of its ability to predict blood pressure from only the PTT measurements during the interventions for that subject. So here are the accuracy results. The calibration curves from the baseline period in blue corresponded fairly well to the measured BP-PTT data pairs during the interventions in red. So the blue has to fall on top of the red points for this calibration curve to be accurate. The subject average blood pressure bias and precision errors yielded by the calibration curves were within just five to seven millimeter of mercury. In sum, the nonlinear model method can derive a patient-specific calibration curve without invoking a blood pressure intervention. I, I call it perturbationless calibration of PTT to blood pressure. However, the main disadvantage of the method is that it requires blood pressure waveforms as the input 
and those waveforms are diff not easy to obtain in practice. So given the challenge of calibrating PTT to blood pressure, we looked for a different approach to realize blood pressure monitoring without a cuff. Our idea was to extend the oscillometric cuff principle for cuffless and calibration-free monitoring of blood pressure via a smartphone. As shown here, the user serves as the actuator, actuator by pressing their fingertip against the phone to steadily increase the pressure of the underlying artery, while the phone, embedded with PPG force transducer unit, serves as a sensor to measure the variable amplitude blood volume oscillations and apply pressure. The phone also provides visual feedback to guide the finger actuation over time and then computes blood pressure from the measured oscillogram, just like a cuff device. The phone could also warn users of high blood pressure, securely transmit the measured blood pressure to caregivers, and send text reminders to patients with high blood pressure measurements to take their meds. In this way, a complete hypertension management system would be available in the pockets of many. So we developed a smartphone-based device to implement this oscillometric finger pressing method in real time. The prototype device is a 3D printed case fixated on the back of a smartphone. The case houses an infrared reflectance mode PPG sensor on top of a thin filmed capacitive force transducer to measure blood volume oscillations from, from the fingertip at the transverse palmar arch artery, as well as the applied fingertip pressure. The case also includes circuitry to acquire and transmit the measurements to the phone. The smartphone includes an app to visually guide the amount of fingertip pressure applied over time and compute systolic and diastolic blood pressure at the brachial artery from the finger measurements via an empirical algorithm or output try again in the event of an actuation measurement or computation failure. So one thing about this device uh, that's very unique is that it's trying to measure blood pressure at the fingertip. Uh, we had not seen whether that was feasible or not based on previous literature. I hope you can hear this demonstration. Here is a video demonstrating smartphone-based blood pressure monitoring via the isolometric finger pressing method. We created a prototype device to implement the method in real time. The main components of the device are a sensor unit to record the applied finger pressure and blood volume oscillations, a visual display to guide the finger actuation, and an algorithm to compute blood pressure from the finger measurements. A user interacts with the device to measure blood pressure in three steps. First, the user places his index finger on the sensor unit on the back of the phone according to the line indicators. In particular, the base of the fingernail is aligned with line one, and the long axis of the finger is centered on line two. The user places the finger flat on the encasing rather than at an angle. Second, the user turns the phone over to view the smartphone screen and holds the device at heart level. Third, the user presses his finger against the sensor unit so as to steadily increase the applied pressure over time. The user must keep the cursor, which indicates the current pressure being applied, in between the target blue lines. Once the finger pressure is being high enough, the measurement automatically terminates and the blood pressure levels are displayed. If the applied pressure falls outside the target lines, or a measurement or an algorithm problem occurs, the device will ask the user to try again. A BP measurement of 125 over 84 millimeters of mercury is obtained in this demonstration. So we prospectively tested the smartphone-based device in terms of usability and accuracy 
against a standard arm cuff device and 32 volunteers. For comparison, we likewise assess the accuracy of a finger cuff volume clamp device, which is FDA cleared for measuring blood pressure at the brachial artery from the finger, finger measurements. So I, this is a device uh, that we paid $30,000 for. And we compared our smartphone device to a standard arm cuff device, and at the same time, the finger cuff device to the standard arm cuff device. Uh, but first, we looked at the usability. How usable was the smartphone-based device? And here are those results. About 90% of the users were able to learn the finger actuation after just one or two practice trials. Uh, we had not many people uh, outside of the study. The first time they tried to press their fingertip on the phone, they were able to do it correctly. The device yielded blood pressure measurements more often than try agains. And the majority of the try again messages that were obtained were due to computation failure, which is relatively easy to correct by software updates. In sum, the oscillometric finger pressing method can be performed by many. Here are the accuracy results for the smartphone based device and the finger cuff device against the reference arm cuff device. The smartphone-based device yielded bias errors of minus 5.6 and 3.3 millimeter mercury for systolic and diastolic pressure, and precision errors of 7.7 .7 and 8. millimeter mercury over a 40 to 50 millimeter mercury range of arm cuff blood pressure. These level of errors are basically the same as the finger cuff device. So in sum, the oscillometric finger pressing method can yield calibration-free measurement of blood pressure with a level of accuracy comparable to cuff-based devices. So by having the user serve as the actuator, the requisite hardware is greatly simplified. So the oscillometric finger pressing method may be more amenable to widespread dissemination than possible alternative methods that would automatically vary the external pressure. Given the prevalence of hypertension, you can recall the slide I showed at the beginning, widespread dissemination uh, is crucial. So initially, the sensor unit and circuitry could be miniaturized and incorporated within commonly used protective phone encasings. Thereafter, the method could be implemented within the smartphone itself. For example, a thin film pressure sensor could simply be placed on top of the existing PPG sensor on the back of many smartphones. However, the need for special sensors above and beyond the smartphone does limit the accessibility of the method. To our great surprise, it turns out that PPG and force sensors already in iPhones and other smartphones can be leveraged to implement the oscillometric finger pressing method. And we therefore developed an app for the iPhone X. The app employs the front camera for taking selfies as a PPG sensor to measure the blood volume oscillations at the fingertip and the amazingly sensitive strain gauge array under the screen for employing peak and pop as a force sensor to measure the fingertip pressure. The app similarly plots the data as they're being recorded to visually guide the finger actuation. The app includes a one-time measurement of the user's fingertip dimensions. One purpose of this measurement is to guide the fingertip placement on the pressure such that the transverse palmar arch artery is near the camera. The other purpose is to estimate the finger pressing contact area on the screen, which is needed to compute finger pressure as force divided by area. Based on available fingerprint data, we estimate that about 95% of people could achieve finger pressure at a maximum of at least 180 millimeter mercury 
and a resolution of within two millimeter mercury with this app. The app likewise outputs brachial systolic and diastolic pressure via an empirical algorithm. So we t similarly tested an initial version of the app in 18 volunteers. The app yielded blood pressure errors. The, the app yielded blood pressure errors with respect to a standard arm cuff device that were only one to two millimeters of mercury higher than the finger cuff device. In sum, the oscillometric finger pressing method can be implemented simply with an unmodified iPhone. In fact, uh, we estimate that a half a billion smartphones currently in use may have the necessary sensing capabilities. So if you're interested in learning more, here's a list of our reviews, book chapters, and edit editorials on the state of the art in the field of cuffless blood pressure measurement. Uh, we took the opportunity arising from the pandemic uh, to write several of these articles. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Mukamala. Uh, fantastic talk. I'm sure that our audience, especially but not only our students, greatly appreciated it. Um, so I will open uh, the session for discussion together with my colleague, Professor Professor Luis Eduardo. Uh, I first of all have a question from a colleague of our program, Professor Fabio. He's asking, Professor Rama, have you had the opportunity to check the template of a patient with a specific heart disease? Do you think it would change anyhow? Maybe diagnose a specific disease, based on shape, etc. Um, I, I want to understand the question, how the type of heart disease uh, influences the blood pressure measurement accuracy? I believe so. And uh, if Fabio wants to further chime in, he can type in, in the chat so we clarify the question. But I guess that Fabio was pointing to, uh, yes, heart disease on top of hypertension that might affect uh, the template of waveforms and that possibly affect the accuracy of your algorithms. Um, again, that's my interpretation. So Fabio is with us and <laughs> you can chime in and correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I you know, I think that probably uh, heart disease uh, could have an impact, uh, but probably the primary impact is on the state of the arteries uh, and, and the stiffness of the arteries. Um, in influencing the blood pressure measurement. You know, as you get older, you get arterial sclerosis, the arteries get stick, stiffer, thicker, wider. And uh, we're trying to measure blood pressure from, you know, the arteries. And I think that's the primary source. Uh, heart disease, you know, maybe um, certain, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of some cases where there could be a factor in in heart disease i mean if you of course if you had mechanical assist devices and things like that uh because you had heart disease that could be problematic that would make the waveforms uh waveforms different so i i would say yeah probably uh it will have some effect because you know physiology is complicated but i i couldn't um we don't have the data to explain it clearly yeah, in, uh, in fact, I was also thinking of not heart disease, but uh, uh, different situations. Uh, we even emailed back and forth some time ago, you may remember uh, the issue with arterial compliance in, again, maybe not heart disease. I'm thinking of different diseases, especially infections, uh, sepsis, uh, also trauma, and uh, I, I, I also assume, but again, I'm just uh, speaking out of the top of my mind, that uh, definitely, you know, some models, for example, you showed the model to estimate arterial compliance, and uh, you clarified the assumptions under that model, uh, the importance of transmural pressure, and of course, you have assumptions for what is outside the vessels. 
And I believe that in some diseases, and again, I'm not talking about heart disease as, as Fabio was asking about, but in some conditions that medium outside your vessels, either large vessels or peripheral vessels changes. And so uh, your arterial compliance will be affected and therefore any algorithm might be affected. So you definitely need the data as you just pointed out to prove what uh, what's the size, what's the magnitude of that effect on any type of uh, uh, model. Uh, but again, it's for a specific, uh, again, it's a comment on certain specific diseases. Um, Professor Karina, who is also a colleague uh, uh, of our um, uh, bioengineering program, um, congratulates you for the wonderful work. And she would like to know about the sample rate uh, and if you have already done an analysis of blood pressure variability with these signals on top of your models to estimate uh, central blood pressure from peripheral blood pressure uh, and the incorporation uh, in your models of ballistocardiography and the other signals you presented. So um, sampling rate and uh, looking at blood pressure variability on, on a beat by beat basis, is that? Yes. I, um, so sampling rate, uh, you know, the, these arterial waveforms, uh, probably in almost all the cases I showed, they have, um, usually their information is, uh, 10 times the mean heart rate. They'll have harmonic content it's up to that. So if the heart rate is, you know, one, you know, one or two Hertz, you're talking, uh, about, 20, 20 hertz or so. And so your sampling rate should probably be 40, 40 hertz, 40, 50 hertz. And that's usually what we do. But when you detect, uh, when you detect PTT, uh, you need great resolution. So, we, you know, we might measurement at 50 hertz, but we'll oversample it to, you know, maybe even several hundred hertz or a thousand hertz to detect the PTT. In terms of beat to beat blood pressure variability, um, well, in, in these cuff devices, uh, you know, I don't think it's really possible because, you know, you're using the inflation and deflation. And uh, in the PTT approach, it is possible. And there are studies where people look at PTT and how well it tracks uh, beat to beat blood pressure changes. But we, we haven't really looked at those studies uh, of beat to beat variability. We just wanted to get the, you know, the average blood pressure. That in itself is a challenging problem. And to see, can we get the average blood pressure um, during common interve various interve physiologic interventions? So I, I would say that PTT does have correlation on a beat to beat basis with blood pressure, but it, it's not studies done by uh, my collaborators and myself. Perfect. Uh, Professor Luis Eduard, do you have anything that you would like to also discuss, comment uh, from Professor Nkamala talk? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Rama, uh, for our nice presentation. Very clear, very interesting. So I'm very happy to have this opportunity to hear about your research, about your work. Uh, um, my point uh, I'd like to, to hear a little bit is in relation to the transition from the prototype to the effective product. Uh, we, we know that is also difficult to do this jump. Uh, we, we, we make prototypes and we do tests and elaborate several kinds of validation and then we try to to do this uh, transition uh, to reach the market to reach a, a, a effective product to the, the society to people so uh, if you talk a bit about your experience during this transition i i would like to to hear some yeah thank you very much uh, you know that transition is is very difficult and uh, I, the, the work I showed today, I, I haven't translated any of it, uh, although some of the work has been licensed to other companies that I'm not working with. But I, I do have experience from my other research, my earlier research, 
on taking uh, work from a laboratory to actual patient use. And um, it's a very long and difficult process. Uh, I, For me, I had a, um, I'll, I'll give you, I, I try to keep this short, uh, shorter, it's a very long story, but um, I did some work on developing a, a blood flow uh, monitoring algorithm, a cardiac output, we call it, is the blood total blood flow in the circulation. And uh, it was an algorithm. And it computed uh, blood pressure, uh, cardiac output from a blood pressure signal, not systolic and diastolic, but the waveform at the wrist, you know, in millions of op operating room and ICU patients a year, they will get a blood pressure waveform measurement at the wrist. And so if we could compute the cardiac output from that, it could really help the doc treat those patients. And I had ha developed this algorithm and uh, I wanted to, I thought it was better than the state of the art and I wanted to see it to reach patients. And uh, yeah, it was a long road. Uh, one thing I had to do is I, I had no connections uh, with industry. I, you know, I didn't know investors. I didn't know any business people, nothing. So I wrote this business plan and I got some help from the, my university in the, in the state and uh, it took me uh, maybe six months to write that business plan. It had a complete financial model and so forth. And anyways, I, I shopped that business plan around. Once I had it done, I shopped it around to find a CEO to run a company and to try to raise the money. And I happened to meet uh, an entrepreneur in residence. He was a person who was looking for a project a business to lead and he came with money. He had an investor who backed him. And I convinced that person to take the project on. And uh, we started a very tiny company across the street from my university. And we hired a few PhDs and we conducted, you know, when you develop an algorithm, you need a lot of patient data. So the company formed partnerships with hospitals in the country and we collected the patient data and we optimized the algorithms. And after a few years, we were happy with what we had. And uh, the company moved to uh, New York, which is not where I was in. And they implemented the algorithm in this monitor. And, and uh, they, they developed a monitor to implement the algorithm. And uh, then they have to get FDA approval. Uh, and uh, that was very complicated. You know, it required one of the, one of the main things that the document that was submitted by the company for FDA approval was like a thousand pages. And uh, one of the key things was to prove that the device worked. And that involved doing a clinical study. And the FDA had very high standards for that study, uh, a lot higher than I had anticipated, you know, way higher than a journal paper. And then the company got FDA approval, and that was about, um, I would say, six years from the start of the company. And uh, and from 2018, uh, you know, onward, they tried to sell sell the device, and they got C marking in Europe, and uh, um, and uh, now it's being used in. Um, a lot of several hospitals, you know, including some very prestigious ones. And uh, it was a long road. I mean, the key thing is this valley of death. You know, you have an idea, you believe in it, you want to uh, bring it to practice. How do you overcome the valley of death? You know, usually the technology stuck in that valley and you need some great force, you know, to get rid of the inertia and get it up. And that business plan was the thing. And then you need to raise money. And then you need to get the science to work. And then you need to do FDA. Uh, I'd say it takes uh, a lot of determination to do it, but you know, many people have done it and uh, it's necessary. It's necessary. Otherwise, you know, without commercializing, uh, we can't touch society. And uh, yeah, so it's a long process. Uh, there's a lot of challenges and it's completely different from uh, academia. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question well. Oh, yes, 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 y
and I totally agree with uh, your claim that it is necessary a lot of determination to to do this transition from the academia to the market is really not easy, but I think uh, it's worthwhile to insist in this way. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, Tati, if you have time for one more question. Yes, we do have time. We have 10 minutes. Okay. okay. Uh, just a, a curiosity, Professor Rama, in relation to the algorithm. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's the case, uh, and I don't know if you, you uh, think about that or tried some thinking about that. Um, did you consider to use any uh, type of machine learning um, tools or machine learning um, approach to, to support the algorithm? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And um, especially in the world of cupless blood pressure measurement. So today, th th this is the state. Everyone wants to eliminate uh, the cuff from blood pressure measurement. And at the same time, here we are in this machine learning era. And um, we have, and, and thirdly, uh, it, we have uh, convenient sensing. You know, people are doing wearables and things like that, and very convenient sensors. Your smartphone can measure a PPG uh, a arterial pulse. So when you put all three of those things together, Many people are trying to achieve cuffless blood pressure measurement by applying machine learning to waveforms that can be measured with smart devices and wearables and things like that. And uh, you'll find a, you know scores of papers on that in the literature. And uh, you know it's something that uh, I have a hard time uh, believing can work because there's there's really no physiologic basis for it. I mean, machine learning is not magic. You can't put information in a measurement. The measurement either has the information or it doesn't. And if it does, then machine learning is the best way to extract it. And uh, anyway, I you know there's some device. There's a couple, a couple of cuffless devices uh, that are on the market uh, now. And uh, they may invoke some machine learning. It's not that clear, it's not described well, but they require periodic calibration with cuff device. So you have to make a cuff measurement and then you can do cuffless for a month. You know, it's not true calibration free. And uh, so, you know, they could be doing some machine learning, but in any case, um, you know, we see all these papers because this is an important field to us. And uh, we actually uh, did a lot of studies uh, to see if the PPG wave, and I didn't present any of those studies today, uh, but we, we recorded PPG waveforms and arm cuff blood pressure during various perturbations to blood pressure interventions, like I showed cold presser, mental arithmetic, this type of stuff. And we did some simple machine learning uh, to see. Uh, the reason why we made it simple is because every time I see a paper, that I'll get a claim that machine learning helps in couples blood pressure. And I'll be like, well, what was the feature in the waveform that was useful? And it's never answered. And so we did some basic things to try to see if we could find the features and how they're related to blood pressure. And actually to our surprise, we found that these PPG waveforms, you know, you can me you know, you measure with a finger clip or a smartphone, or, you know, there's so many of these uh, types of sensors actually did have a little bit of blood pressure information in it. It had about, I would say, 10% information of blood pressure. So let's say, for example, you de developed a machine learning model uh, based on demographics like age, height, weight, gender, things like that. And let's say that model predicts blood pressure with an error of eight mil uh, 10 millimeter of mercury. Then if you add the PPG waveform to the machine learning model, the error will go to nine millimeter of mercury. And that one millimeter of mercury is statistically significant. So there, I guess in some, and that was a give a long winded answer, is that um, machine learning can help a little bit, I think. Uh, but the, the key thing is we need the measurements that actually have blood pressure in it. 
Okay, thank you for your answers and again, congratulations to your outstanding work. Uh, I think uh, unless there's, we still have five minutes, so if anyone have questions, let's take advantage of Professor Mukamala's time before we let him off the hook. But if there's no other question, uh, we can probably wrap it up here. Um, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, we're so grateful that you accepted our invitation. And I'm sure that uh, your talk really presented something very unique in these three days. And uh, and this discussion, I, I, you know, Professor Luis Eduardo's question, I'm so happy that he asked you these questions. I, I would have asked you in case nobody <laughs> had, because I knew about your experience also trying to translate your research to the real world in the market, the industry. So I think this was very beneficial to all the audience because of the also the general objectives of this workshop as a workshop about innovation. So Rama, thank you uh, a lot uh, for your for your in, uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, your great talk. And uh, well, we hope to have you with us again sometimes in the future. I will just uh, let uh, Tatiana maybe. Uh, with some closing remark, uh, uh, wrap up this session. Okay, thank you, Federico. No, I'd just like to say again, thank you for your presentation and congratulations are about your work. And we would like to invite you next time you we can maybe on next edition of our workshop, maybe you can come to Brazil and be in person here with us. So. Uh, we invite you to come and visit us in our institute. Thank you very much, Hama. Thank you very much. My deepest gratitude for ha uh, for having me and uh, your excellent questions and interest. And you know, the only regret for me was it wasn't in person. But thank you very much. Okay, perfect. So uh, we can close the session. We can thank you again, uh, Dr. Mukamala, uh, Professor Luis Eduardo, Professor Tachana, and uh, we expect uh, our participants back at 1.30 with a section on uh, signals and a presentation on uh, machine learning in bioengineering for uh, uh, brain-human interfaces and deep electrical stimulation. Uh, have a good lunch break, everyone, and uh, see you later.